Thank you for joining us this evening, and please join me in welcoming Ben Weiss. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good evening, and thank you for coming. Um, uh, to start, I want to thank um, Jasmine Hagens and Kristen Hoskins, who just introduced me, um, for organizing this talk, which is part of a series that explores the relationship between American landscapes, American experience, and the American identity. That's sort of a big task. Um, the per but the particular prompt for this talk was, as, as Kristen said, the um, exhibition Audubon's Birds, Audubon's Words, which is on view through May 11th um, in a gallery just a couple of walls behind you. Um, the Roberts Gallery on the lower level of the American Wing. Um, and it's a chance to have a look at the MFAs or part of the MFAs uh, copy of the Birds of America. And it's a rare chance. We don't actually put it out on view very often. Um, so many of the birds that are on the walls now have not been out since we acquired them in 1921. Um, some have, but most have, <laughs> most have not. Uh, I want to start with a paradox. Um, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I kind of couldn't resist it, and I wasn't going to pitch it too hard. <laughs> um, but uh, so I've been, I've been outed. <laughs> um, why has Audubon, of all of the artists of the American 19th century, come to be essentially the poster boy for a giant organization, a giant, um, the, the Audubon Society, which is dedicated to conservation and environmental protection. How did Audubon basically become the brand of the conservation movement? Um, its embodiment, really. Um, there were certainly other contenders. Um, for example, Frederick Church spent his entire career um, capturing the sublime power of the American landscape. This is possibly his most sublime painting, um, The Twilight in the Wilderness from the Cleveland Museum of Art, which you can see in their newly renovated and quite magnificent galleries. Um, so you, know, the, um, you could easily imagine from paintings like this the creation of a Frederick Church Society for Wilderness Protection to you know, save all of this. Um, alternately, Thomas Cole, um, who basically invented American landscape painting, paired his love for upstate New York's will, um, views with tremendous anxiety, and you don't always see this in Cole, um, about what would happen to that landscape. And in fact, this painting, this view in the Catskills, which you can see upstairs in our galleries, just literally two floors above our heads, um, has in it, in this very bucolic, very Arcadian setting, has right here a railroad line, um, which, though it looks very unintrusive to us, um, was not something that pleased Cole. This painting was basically um, a warning about what might happen um, if the machine was let too loose in the garden. Um, so why isn't there a Thomas Cole trust for the preservation of New York farmland or something like that? Um, Audubon's destiny as the embodiment of a conservation movement um, is actually kind of ironic because not only were other artists, like Church and Cole, much more actively concerned about changes in the land and the preservation of the landscape, Audubon himself was, by our standards, not a particularly good conservationist. Um, he didn't write very much about the preservation of land. He didn't seem to worry terribly much about the dangers of progress. Um, an ardent lover of animals, and especially birds, though he was. And there's no, there no doubt about his tremendous love for what he called the feathered tribe. Um, all of the birds um, in his book were murdered by Audubon. <laughs> um, he, was a, he was a mass murderer of birds, and this often comes as a shock to people when they come to the exhibition, um, including my father, who's not exactly a, a, a sort of a, 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 sh a shrinking violet on these, on these matters. I had no idea. Um, this is, this is, something must be done about this. <laughs> um, 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 and yet, that was, in some ways, the key to Audubon's knowledge. Um, he, knew his, he knew these birds very, very intimately. Um, so it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, Audubon, who has come to stand for the very creatures that he killed with such enthusiasm, is, um, is an icon of, American, of, 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 un, of wild America. Um, so how did it happen? I think the key lies in understanding his central achievement, which is the birds of America, the great book that he produced over the course of about 20 years, roughly. Um, I think he would agree, since he also thought that there was nothing that he had done in his life to match it. 
Um, so let's have a look at the book. Um, here is where it often shows up in the news, um, being sold. Um, it's a book that is routinely described in superlatives, um, one of the most common of which is in terms of superlatives of money. Um, it's, it's a crass measurement of importance, but it's, you know, it's, it's one that we actually use quite a lot. Um, the, this is a, an auction a couple of years ago where, where the book was sold. All These are the books. These are the giant books. This is not a small object. They're, each volume is three feet high. Um, was sold for $7.9 million, um, which was not a record um, because a couple of years before that, another copy had sold for $11.5 million. In fact, if you trust The Economist magazine on matters of this, and it, these numbers are always very squishy, um, it's, you count in different ways, until, fairly re until recently, five of the top 10 slots for most expensive printed books ever sold were copies of The Birds of America. Um, now, it's true that the birds were recently knocked off their perch by another, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that one didn't actually start intentional. It kind of slipped into an early rehearsal, and I have been, yeah. Um, but uh, you may recall in the fall that a copy of the Bay Psalm book, the first book printed in, Nor in North America, in English America, not by any standards the first book printed in the Western Hemisphere, but the first one printed in these parts sold, um, was sold off by Old South Church, that went for more. But in a funny way, that's actually... That record, that record price for a book, becomes a measure of Audubon's significance because the Besson book was a genuine rarity. There are only about 10 copies in existence. Um, it is um, the only one that's likely to come onto the market, and it sold for more money than a Birds of America, but not much more. Um, I mean, you couldn't have those top five slots or those five of 10 slots in their auction records for the Birds. Um, uh, without there being some of them around. So it, it's, it's an interesting measure. It's not a book that is impossibly, impossible to get hold of, and yet it still commands prices that are that, that extraordinary. So the, if the Besson book is, is, is exceedingly rare, um, and the Birds of America is not, you know, tremendously, tremendously rare, there are about 120 copies in existence, and there are easy enough to find. I mean, if you walk out the front door of the MFA, go over to the Green Line, and get on the trolley, you can get off at Copley and see the BPL's copy. You can um, get, go a couple stops more and get off at Park and um, see the copy of the State Library. You can go to the Athenaeum and see their copy. If you trust the red line to get you anywhere these days, um, you can go, go to Harvard and see two and a half copies there, and so on and so on. In most of the major centers of the Northeast, there is going to be a copy of the Birds of America. Um, so, if the book isn't stupendous, stupendously rare, um, you, sorry, I've gone off my script again. Um, um, it is at least incredibly big as this, uh, as this pile of books here and this um, kind of uh, publicity shot from the auction house shows. Um, it is a very, very large object. I mean, each page is three feet high. Um, it was printed on special paper made especially for the Birds of America, um, a paper that's come to be called Double Elephant. Um, um, and here's a, a small cocktail party moment. Double Elephant is not a term that's used widely in the rare book world. It's a term that was actually invented to describe the specially large paper used for the Birds of America. Um, it's basically a way of saying this book is really, really big. Um, so if you hear someone calling us, describing a book as a double elephant, they're probably, they're almost certainly going to be talking about an Audubon. But even though that's the case, it's not the largest book ever printed. I mean, there are other books from its, of its very vintage that are nearly as big. This is another publicity shot from another auction house um, showing um, a woman in sort of to give scale for a copy of one of the plate volumes of the description of Egypt, the great series of books that were published after Napoleon's failed attempt to conquer Egypt. Um, the conquest failed, but the, the sort of scientific survey that went along with it and the archeological survey that went along with it came back to France and published, published this ginormous book. Um, it's, and, and as someone who's worked in rare book libraries for many years um, can tell you, just the, fact that it is big does not necessarily mean that it is tremendously special. Um, if you've ever had to shelve the folios in a library, um, sometimes a big book is just a really big, heavy book. Um, so there, it's not just a matter of size. Um, these happen to be very special big books, but 
Um, okay, so it is beautiful at least. And here is one of the birds that has become the poster, the poster child for the show, the roseate spoonbill. Um, and there is no question that the book, as you turn its pages or sift through an unbound copy, is just this overwhelming display of incredibly beautiful images of large ones, small ones, medium-sized ones, over and over again that sort of jump at you, because partly because of their size, partly because of their, their vividness. Um, but that alone also isn't enough, because the early 19th century, when Birds of America was published, was the golden age of color plate books of this sort. Um, there were color plate books done with hand colored, you know, hand colored images like the birds um, on all sorts of subjects, on lilies, for example. This is Pierre-Joseph Redoute's Lilies, um, which was published just a few years before Audubon, 1802 to 1816. Um, it's kind of a scary one, I think. But um, here are two slightly less scary ones from the same book. The same effect as you turn these very large pages, these flowers come out at you in much larger than life size in this case. Um, there were color plate books on antiquities. Um, this is a collection, essentially a sales catalog, um, done in the 1770s of um, William Hamilton's uh, collection of Greek vases, which he was trying to sell off from Naples. Um, again, not a small thing, like, you know, like yay. Um, there were books of faraway places. This is Thomas, for a, a page from Thomas Daniel's Oriental Scenery, which was essentially a way to bring British India back to Britain. Um, published, again, just around the turn of the 19th century. Um, many, many dozens of pages of temples and forests and ethnic types. Um, there are even books on birds. Um, this is um, from Francois Lavain's Natural History of the Birds of Paradise. Um, nice, a nice title. Um, and this, again, not small, um, but you know, who can turn down a toucan? Um, so, Incidentally, except for this last one, the Levin, the MFA doesn't have any of these books. So if you happen to have something you'd like to discuss with me after the lecture, <clears throat> um, I will be um, here. Uh, but even though all of these books and um, are very beautiful and large and expensive, and they really all are, these are these are some of the sort of top spots, the high spots in the in the rare book world, in the illustrated book world at least. Um, they don't command a reputation or even remotely a pr the price that you might expect for, from an Audubon. I mean, I'm just curious, how many of the people in this room have heard of the Birds of America before you walked in? Yeah, everybody. How many have heard of any of these books that I just showed you? I see four or five hands. Um, and that's, I think that's pretty telling. Um, it's not, because these are very impressive objects when, when, you, get hold, when you get hold of one. Um, why? Um, what is different about the birds? The common argument is that the birds are just, are just different, that they're better somehow than anything that went before them. Um, but I don't know what that means, because I don't know what it means to say that a book or the images in a book are better. I can tell you how they are different, um, but better is one of those categories, is one of those terms that seems very slippery in historical terms. Um, what, one, what one century views as better, another century might view as decadent or awkward. Um, so I think to get a sense of how Audubon's art plays in our imagination, you need to have some sense of what went before when people were showing you pictures of birds. And so um, just to start a little ways back, um, this is a very early bird. Um, oh god, that one wasn't even intentional. <laughs> I've done a lot of talks this week. I'm a little punchy. <laughs> um, uh, this is an ancient Roman mosaic with a peacock in it um, that is part of the collections of the Harvard Art Museums. And in some ways, this is an advertisement because when the Harvard Museums reopen in the fall, uh, there's a very good chance that this will be on view. So keep in mind that you can see this ancient, sort of sec probably second century mosaic of a bird in your own city um, in a few months. Um, it's basically a way of saying that birds go back in Western art all the way as far as you can go. Um, but the idea of a bird book uh, really is something that's born in the Renaissance. And one of the earliest is by is a 16th century French book by Pierre Bellon um, the, called The Natural History of the Birds, nice and straightforward, with descriptions and simple, 
simple, he says, naïf uh, portraits taken from nature. So these arguing that these are these images, which to our um, mind probably seem lively, but maybe a little bit stiff. Um, this is an image taken from the living creature. This is an image taken from life. Um, it may or may not be. That's beside the point, but that's the argument, um, at least. These are woodcuts that you know, set themselves next to the descriptive text, and Bellon sets up the pattern that pretty much all bird books use for the next few hundred years, which is that you have um, chapter by chapter, the name of the bird, a description of the bird, and a picture of the bird, all sort of put together. Um, and you find this over and over and over again for you know, several centuries. Um, and there's very rel relatively little deviation from it. Um, in the eight, early 18th century, um, this is a fellow named Johann Leon Leonhard Frisch, a, a German artist, bird watcher, naturalist, linguist, in the 1720s, who's trying to put together a compilation of all the birds of Germany. Um, and though these are, again, you can argue that they're fairly simple, um, it's clear that he is watching birds. I mean, these are birds that are behaving like birds. Uh, this is a pair of finches of some sort. Um, that seems very bird-like behavior to me. I mean, one's looking up and away, one's looking down. Um, and he's clearly observing these birds with a great deal of care. These are um, etchings, so prints that were made in black and white and then hand-colored. The book is full of them. The little nice touch I noticed today, um, he's carefully labeled them as him and her, him and her, him and her, each one, all the way through. Um, so this is, I mean, this is a scientific, this is a, it's a work with scientific intentions, at least. Um, and, you know, Frisch has his, has his specialties. Um, he is particularly well known for his owls, um, which, if you look at the way the prints in the book are made, um, makes sense. He's working with um, etching. He's working with um, a copper plate, and you dig into it, or you scratch into it. Um, and you can, one of the things that it's very good, you can get very well in an etching, is sort of little hatch, little hatch marks, um, which are perfect for an owl's feathers. I mean, that sort of layered effect that you get, you get with owls. And he plays that up very much here, and then he sort of colors them in. These are very vivid, and I actually find them somewhat frightening creatures. Um, uh, it, but it's, I mean, he's, He's going for an effect. Um, it's, these are not just simple pictures. They're, they're fairly thought through pictures. And that continues. The more you go through the 18th century during the great efflorescence of bird books that begins to appear in the 1740s and 1750s and 1760s, um, there is a huge expansion of interest in the natural world, um, partly because of an enlightenment desire to take the entire universe and neatly categorize it, get it sorted out by um, by categories, by species, by families, and stuff it into the pages of a book. So in the 17, particularly in France, you start to get a lot of bird books um, in the second half of the century. This is from uh, Maturin uh, Brisson, Maturin Jacques Brisson. Um, I just included this one partly because it's an example of one that isn't all that fancy, but is quite charming. It's, it's a cockatoo, after all. I mean, it's all right. I, I put it in largely because I like it. Um, <laughs> but but it does stand in for a sort of standard issue book. You get slightly fancier books as well. Um, and this is from Buffon. Um, this is Georges Buffon, um, who really is trying to pull together all of the species that he, can, that he can pull together. And here's, I think, where you start to get something fairly interesting. Because he's decided that he doesn't want to just have birds on a, on a, on a background. He's decided to embed them in landscapes. But this is the middle of the 18th century in France. and. What he does is embed them in landscapes that are essentially academy approved. You know, this is if you were, you go to the you go to the king's menagerie and or the stuff or the stuffed bird center, um, and you decide you want a, to do a picture of what the French call a spatula. Um, this is a spoonbill, um, la spatule, um, and he, you embed it in what is basically a rustic landscape that could have walked or been lifted bodily out of a painting by someone like Hubert Robert. Um, this, is a, this is your standard rustic landscape. Um, the toucan, which is from further away and more exotic parts, um, gets this kind of vaguely wildernessy. it's not around here, there aren't farmers nearby, I don't know where really they live, 
and so I'll throw in a couple of palm trees. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's effective, I mean, they're very beautiful, um, but it's, um, it's a different sort of scientific illustration. It's a, it's, but it is something, is, it has changed slightly. Um, what's interesting is that the pattern is the same no matter, or it tends to be the same no matter where you are. This is um, a Carolina parrot, or a Carolina parakeet, from the first book dedicated to American birds. Um, which is by Mark Catesby, published in London in the, in the 1720s, um, sorry, 1730s. Um, and in good enlightenment fashion, Catesby gives you what you need to know. Um, he does show the bird in an, it's an environment, actually. I mean, this is the bird. This is the sort of plant it likes to perch on. And this is what it likes to eat. So this is not just a random sprig. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Carolina parrot-specific sprig. Um, and that's what you find there. This pattern, whether it's a little bit more ambitious and not scientific, like, like Buffon's, or not so artistically ambitious and um, like this, basically continues all the way through and takes us to about 1810, which is the first American, the first bird book about American birds produced in America, which is Alexander Wilson's American Ornithology. Um, and this is um, some shorebirds from that. Uh, I've always thought that this plate and many of the pictures in Wilson's book, Wilson is a very interesting character. There's a new um, biography out about him, which I highly recommend. I think it's available in the shop. Um, he's a Scotsman who um, comes to the States and starts to catalog American birds. Um, I've always thought the illustrations look a little bit like duck decoys. Um, uh, and, I, and I don't mean that in a sort of snide way. I mean, that's, it's, it's, I think what he is often working from are stuffed specimens. Um, a lot of these people are working from stuffed specimens. So that gets you to where Audubon comes into the picture. Um, and here is, our, here is our Byronic hero in what was um, his favorite portrait. Um, this is, there are many portraits of Audubon. This is the one that he liked the most himself. Um, it's, uh, this, is a reproductive, this is a reproductive print after the painting, but I think it captures some of the some of the sense of the fellow. His personal story is, frankly, a very American one, um, not least of which in the sense that he was coming from somewhere else. Um, he was born in Haiti, uh, the illegitimate son of a French merchant. Um, his father brought him to France. Um, he had a, his father was one of these sort of overseas merchants who had holdings in various places outside of France and didn't see any reason that he should stop having human interest when he was away from France. So he had a separate family in Haiti, and he had one family in Haiti, another family in France. When the, the Haitian Revolution came, the, the slave re revolt that basically um, drove um, the, French, the French colonizers out, um, he, took his, he, took his young, he took his children back to France where, um, and settled them in Nantes, where in a very interesting touch, his real wife basically took the kids in and raised them um, as her own. Um, he got all of the privileges and, that you would expect from the son of a wealthy but not aristocratic um, sort of merchant type. Um, he, went, he was sent off to schools. Um, he took lots of, he took drawing lessons. He took, he was very musical, took a lot of music lessons. He was not a particularly diligent student. Um, he had a tendency, even at an early age, to wander out into the, to leave school, wander out into the woods and come back with all sorts of things, you know, frogs in his pockets, that kind of, you know, that kind of kid. Um, but he was incredibly ebullient, incredibly enthusiastic, always going after his latest sort of obsession, his latest passion, but always returning to wildlife and always returning to birds. Um, he began to train as a naval officer. His father wanted to set him up with a, with a proper career, um, but he washed out. Uh, he, his math, he was not, he was not sort of um, systematic enough and his math wasn't good enough. Um, and then when the Napoleonic Wars came and it became clear that they were going to drag on, um, his father decided that it was time to essentially protect the family line. Um, so he, sh um, he was a very, the father was, actually had a lot of foresight. He had, a number of years before, he had arranged a bolt hole, essentially, in the United States. He had bought a farm in, <coughs> pardon me, um, in eastern Pennsylvania, 
um, which had the possibility of, a, um, of, of opening a lead mine in it. Um, so that was, in case things went, went south in Europe, this was a place for the family to go. When it became clear that the wars were going to go on a long time and that conscription would probably come into, come into play, um, he took John James um, and put him on a boat and sent him to the States by himself um, at age 16, 17, roughly, um, carrying um, a false passport. So when Audubon shows up in the States, he's effectively a draft dodger and an illegal immigrant. Um, so this is, again, a very American way to, um, anyway. Um, in short order, he learned English. He had not spoken any English up to this point. He'd only spoken French. So he learned, starts to learn a little bit, of, little bit of English on the boat. When he lands in the States, he um, uh, finds himself being taught English by Quakers, which means that he used a lot of these and thous, he had a quite sort of formal English manner for, um, for much of his life. Um, he settled on the farm. He was the same here as he had been there. He was gregarious and energetic and effusive and athletic and highly distractible. Um, he continued to be obsessed with birds, always wandering off, sort of looking at the local species, um, filling the house with specimens, um, following birds through the woods, tagging them, banding them. Um, naturally, he fell in love with a girl next door, Lucy Bakewell. And after a very long and complicated um, courtship, he won the approval of her father, his father, and the girl. Not in that order. Um, <laughs> I think the girl came first, his father came second, her father came third. Um, they got married. Eventually, the mine got canceled. Um, and uh, Lucy and John James pick up and move west. Um, now, this is in the early years of the 19th century. This is in, you know, in the 18, 18 aughts. When moving west means going essentially over the Appalachians to the Ohio Valley. Um, this is um, the moment after the great imperial struggles that have been sort of keeping them, the English colonists bottled up along the East Coast are done, and the French are gone. Um, the Ohio Valley, the Mississippi Valley become available. Available, but they become accessible. Um, and this is the moment when places like Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and Louisville start to boom. Uh, so he lands first in Pittsburgh, then in Louisville, and sets up with a, with a partner as a, essentially as a dry goods merchant, um, where um, he proves yet again that he is not suited to um, a desk job. He's a terrible businessman. Um, he is so, it's not entirely his fault. All early 19th century businesses, in fact, all pre-modern businesses, have this boom and bust cycle as part of their, essentially as part of their DNA. He gets very he gets pretty wealthy one year, buys himself a couple of slaves. The next year, he's not attentive enough to his work, and the um, and um, business almost goes bankrupt. As more and more settlers come west, more and more people who are savvy in business come west, and he and his partner and Lucy and now their growing family keep sort of moving west along the Ohio and then down the Mississippi Valley, essentially to find in areas where there is less competition. Always, though, he's running away from work. He's running off into the woods. He's drawing birds. He's bringing specimens home. And eventually, Lucy says that this won't do um, and that there needs to be some stability. So she essentially decides that she's going to be this, the, the, the focus of stability. She opens a school. Um, and around about the middle of the 18 teens, they start to talk about turning the, um, the, the negatives of Audubon's character into positives. Um, if he is not going to be a decent merchant, if he's not going to be someone who sits around and gets his job done properly, and he is going to be painting endlessly, um, maybe that's what he should be doing. Um, and they begin to, I think together, they begin to craft the idea of um, this project for the Birds of America. Um, the idea was that the book, the project, would include every species of bird in North America, <clears throat> or at least in northern North America, North America, drawn at life-sized. So uh, when you go out into that gallery and you look at the, at the birds on the wall, they are all more or less the size they would be in nature. Um, and that was one of, the, one of the rules of the book. Sometimes that means there isn't enough bird for the page, and the, and the bird is sort of tucked in the middle. Sometimes the bird is too big for the page and has to be kind of contorted. Um, and he gets very clever at fitting the birds um, into, into positions. But um, 
he's a good artist, um, but he's not, at this point, a great artist. And uh, it's interesting to watch his development because there's a tranche of early drawings and watercolors at Harvard. Um, they did a lovely show a few years back about the early Audubon. Um, and this is what Audubon looks like before he's Audubon, or essentially. It's, a, it's an ivory-billed woodpecker, uh, a pear, um, that he painted long before he had actually seen an ivory-billed woodpecker. Um, and uh, it's very skilled work. Um, the, these, are, these are birds with personality. They're, these are birds that could clearly be identified by their markings. Um, it would do, basically. Um, what's interesting is that he, because he is untrained in a, in a formal way, he's hunting around for, all, for influence everywhere. And this is basically copied out of Wilson's, and then previous to that, Catesby's, um, pictures of an ivory-billed woodpecker. I mean, he's willing to take from other painters when he needs, or other artists when he needs to. He also takes lessons wherever he can get them, uh, from whether it's, whether it's a traveling folk artist in the, um, in the West, or when he comes East, he gets lessons from people like Thomas Sully. Um, it's never a systematic artistic training. It's always a kind of catch-as-catch-can approach. But he also practices by doing portraiture himself, and this is one of a pair of really quite rare early Audubons we have in the collection. Um, he, uh, he paints portraits, and I don't think anyone would argue that this was a particularly good portrait. Um, uh, this is a... a, a a neighbor in Louisville, basically, and his wife. Now, that one's somewhat better. Um, but what is notable about, well, at least the one on the right, I think, um, if you get close, it's clear that he has a tremendous sensitivity to texture. He's, um, he's trying very hard to capture the different ways that light is, 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 is catching on her skin in different ways, um, you know, whether it's full on or mostly occluded or just as the cheek comes out again. Um, this is someone who's really attentive to the way a surface feels. And that is something which becomes a real hallmark of Audubon as, as a painter and Audubon as a bird artist. Um, the way to take the measure of that, though, is not to really to look at the prints that we have on view here, because you don't really see them on the book, the prints that come out of the book. Where you do see it, uh, is on the original watercolor, and I don't want to use the word watercolor, but that's the term we've been using, the original paintings for the Birds of America, which are all owned by the New York Historical Society, um, and which you will have the chance at least um, to look at in a few weeks. They um, are doing a massive three-part exhibition, started last year, continues this year, and goes on next year, of all of the Audubon watercolors they have, or all of the Audubon paintings they have for the birds of America. They're calling it something like the complete flock, um, Audubon's aviary. It, people can't seem to avoid this. I'm, everybody makes bird jokes when they, when they do bird talks or bird books. or. But it's very much worth your time to go. Um, the New York Historical Society is the building that's just south of the Natural History Museum on Central Park West. Um, because when you see the originals, you get this sense of someone who is desperately trying and usually succeeding to capture the surface of the of the animal of the of the bird. He, he these aren't watercolors. These are mixed media creations. He uses watercolor, both opaque and transparent. He uses graphite. He uses sand. He uses oil paint. He scratches the surface. He digs into the paint, all in it in an attempt to capture the actual f impression that he has of the of the bird's of the bird's feathers, of the bird's beak, of the shine on um, the eye. He's obsessed with getting it at life, essentially, even though he has just killed this bird, usually. Um, he's very critical of other artists um, and of museums um, because they're not trying to do this. And um, it does raise a question, how do you do this? This is 1816, 1817, 1821, 1822. There's no photography yet. Um, he is going off into the woods and he's looking and he's watching the birds very carefully. Uh, then he's shooting the birds. <laughs> um, but without photography, how do, you, how do you work with what you've got? I mean, for example, um, the very first books that are 
I mean, photography isn't invented until 1839. And for decades after that, it's nowhere near fast enough to capture birds on the wing, it's, um, or frankly, even when they're sitting still because birds move so much. So the very first bird books that are done with photography mostly come from the 18, late 1880s and 1890s. This is one from 1898, um, which shows a pair of herring gulls. Um, if you look really closely at the images in this book, because the book is called The Birds That Hunt and Are Hunted. Um, if you look really closely at the photographs, you find that they are not photographs of live birds. They are photographs of taxidermy specimens set up in museum dioramas. So even when you first start to get photographic bird books, they're not really photographic bird books. So how does Audubon do it? How does he capture the birds um, in the manner he sees them, in the manner he remembers them, when all he's got is his head and his pen? Well, he invents a device long before he actually comes up with the idea of um, doing this project. Uh, he comes up with a, a very simple and portable method to capture birds in the poses he remembers seeing them in the wild. It's always been a little bit unclear what this thing looked like. This is the best recent reconstruction, um, actually done for the catalog of that New York show. Um, and the idea is that he goes out, he watches, he shoots, he brings the bird back, and then he sets it up on this gridded board. This is a board with wire square, or wire grid made up of squares. He arranges it as close as he possibly can to the position that he remembered it being in, pins it down, and starts painting. Um, so get this as the first thing. Then he starts to fill in the rest. So he goes and gets another bird, um, or maybe he has two already, um, and fills in the rest. And then the background comes after. So this is a kind of iterative process. He's so slowly building up the picture um, and trying to create in these, in these paintings, the universe in which he saw the bird, but not exactly the universe, because he, wants to, he does want it to have some sort of scientific utility, so he tries to include a male of the species, a female of the species, um, sometimes a juvenile, um, always a plant on which it looked like, uh, on which it would live, maybe a nest, maybe something it was eating. Um, and um, he, sees this not just as a scientific as a, as a scientific duty, but he sees it as, a, as an artistic duty, and he doesn't see the two as being separate. Um, take such advantage, this is him, take such advantages away from the naturalist, who ought to be an artist also, and he fails as completely at his task as Raphael himself must have done had he not fed his pencil with all belonging to a mind perfectly imbued with a knowledge of real forms, real muscles, real bones, real movements, and the spiritual expression of feelings that paintings like his express so beautifully. He wants to capture the essence of the creature, and he knows that he has to do it by capturing the thing in life. So Audubon's birds don't just sit on branches. So, you know, here's, here's Kate Spee's um, Carolina parrot, parrot in a perfectly complete packet. I mean, you get, as I said, you have the bird, you have the, you have the plant, and you have the food. Here's Audubon's Carolina parrot, um, which is actually composed of exactly the same elements. You have bird, you have branch, and you have food, the cockleburr, which is what Carolina parrots eat, and they seem to eat basically nothing else. Um, one of the things that got them in trouble. Um, but what he's trying to do is give you the experience of seeing the Carolina parrot, not just the ability to recognize it. And this is one of the things, he, he, um, this is from his description of the bird. Um, they are quite at ease on trees of any, or any kind of plant, moving sideways, climbing or hanging in every imaginable posture, assisting themselves very dexterously in all their motions with their bills. They usually alight extremely close together. I have seen branches of trees as completely covered by them as they could possibly be. He's taking you to what he saw. Um, Catesby gives you a specimen. Audubon gives you an experience. And he was, he recognized that this was his strength. He was always very self-conscious about the fact that he didn't have proper schooling or that he had wasted his chance at proper schooling. Um, and even wrote very explicitly, 
I know I am not a scholar. But meantime, I am aware that no man living knows better than I the habits of our birds. No man living has studied them as much as I have done, because he spent his time in the woods, not trapped up in a box, uh, what he called, an off he called the, off the offices of naturalist boxes. Um, and um, he knew that this was going to be a, an issue. He, got, he, in fact, did not get along well with the naturalist establishment in Philadelphia when he went to visit in the 1820s. They didn't trust this guy because he was um, possibly a challenge to their hero, Alexander Wilson, the, the guy with the birds that looked like they were decoys. Um, and he looked like a hick um, coming from Kentucky and uh, Missouri and Flor Florida and Louisiana into, into Philadelphia. Um, but he also recognized that if he wanted the book to come out the way it needed to come out, to come out with images like this, he couldn't do it in the States. Um, in the 1820s, there was no publisher, no printer in the States who could do technically what was needed um, to make the birds of America. So he had to go to England because England was where, England and France, but particularly England, were the places where you could get really, really, really high quality color plate books made. So in 1826, um, or 1825, he sails, and 1826 he lands, um, he takes a package of his watercolors, paintings, um, uh, to England, and he sets his sight on Edinburgh uh, in Scotland, um, where he actually did make his way quite well in local intellectual circles. They didn't have the same issues that Philadelphia did. Um, he was an exotic, perhaps. He's from now from America. Um, makes contacts with the city's leading printer, who is um, William Home Lizars, or Lizards, no one's ever quite sure, it seems, um, who at that moment happened to be printing a bird book of which he was extremely proud and very excited um, by Prideaux John Selby, one of the better names in the history of natural history art. Um, so they're talking, and, he, and, and uh, Lizars is, they're walking back to Lizars' office, basically, or, um, and they're talking, you know, they're talking about birds and they're talking about art, and Lizars is talking up this, this, wonderful, this wonderful painter. His eye, this is a letter to his wife, uh, Audubon's wife. His eye fell on my portfolio. It gave him some other thoughts, I am quite sure, probably was shabby. Um, it is a doubt with me, I opened my, um, it is a doubt with me if I opened my lips at all during all of this, but I slowly unbuckled the straps and putting a chair on the chair for him to set, so takes the chair and puts it down. Sit down, my good sir. Um, and putting a chair for him to set, without uttering a word, I turned up a drawing. Now, Lucy, poor Mr. Selby was the sufferer by that moment. <laughs> Mr. Lizars, quite impressed, exclaimed, my God, I have never seen the like of this. Um, and the deal was done. Lizars becomes his publisher. Um, but that's... You know, shaking a hand and signing a deal is one thing. Actually getting the project done is another. And if you've looked at the prints on view and you've thought about them at all, this is a project of such massive scale that, um, well, just to give you a sense, each plate is three feet high. Um, so that big. Um, which means special paper. And for each image, and there are 435 plates in this book, that means buying a three-foot high copper plate, um, each of which weighs about 27 pounds. Um, so that's enough copper almost to sheathe the bottom of a ship. Um, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. That is literally enough copper for, you know, for a, for a ship. Um, um, it's 435 plates, 12,000 pounds of copper, um, that's six tons. So, and then you have to, once you have your printing plates, you have to get the images onto the printing plates. So, it's, and it's, it's, as we know, it's not just a matter of, photo of, you know, of doing it by photography or photolithography at this point. You have to have someone, a skilled, a skilled worker, a skilled craftsman, an artist really, transfer Audubon's paintings onto the, onto the copper plates where they can be etched and used um, to print on the oversized paper. Um, and then, Oh, so, oh, sorry, I, I had a Selby, I apologize. This is, this is the, this is the sufferer. Um, this is the person who um, was knocked off his perch. Um, there I go again. Um, anyway, here's Audubon's wa um, watercolor or painting of the Blue Jays. You get that transferred to the plate, and of course, they're not printing in color. 
they're printing in black and white. So you print up 200 or 250 of these, um, and then you have to color them. Uh, and you have to color them by hand. Now, that doesn't mean that Audubon is sitting there coloring them in by hand. Uh, this, is a, this is an industry. This is a, a well-established industry. Um, and one of the things that all of the big publishers of color plate books have are essentially factories, whether they're literally buildings where there are people coloring in plates or uh, dispersed work around the, around the world, um, where you have essentially an industrial process. You have, you, you take one of these, the one on the left, this pointer is a little bit weak, um, and you, and Audubon or his printer colors one in the way it should be colored in. So blue here, you know, a little bit of red here, some yellow, and you do three or four of these or any number of these, and you say, this is your guide, and you hand it to the colorers, and they divide it up in, um, in some way or another, you know, whether one person does two colors or one person does all, you know, only does blue, um, and these things are then made by the hundreds. So you, it's, a, it's a really, it's, an, it's a, it's a mass-produced thing, and what's interesting is that they're pretty good. I mean, at keeping consistent. You know, these, they're being paid not to be creative. They're being paid to make these things look exactly the same. And generally, they do. Um, so think about these numbers. 435 prints, and they um, ultimately make about 200 um, copies of the book. That's 87,000 prints that are all being done by hand. Um, so, needless to say, the book is expensive. Um, more than $1,000 in 1830 dollars, which is enough to buy a house. In fact, it's enough to buy a very nice house. So, this is not a project that is meant for um, the cheap, and no one, no publisher, um, has the money to do upfront to do this. Um, uh, ultimately, Audubon doesn't stay with Lazar's. Um, he actually changes publishers shortly after the beginning um, because of uh, quality issues, really, um, with the coloring and a, and a strike at Lazar's factory. And he sets up with a London publisher named Robert Havel. They develop a very close relationship. Um, they become almost brothers, in a way. Um, and uh, that's saying something, because, because Audubon was not an easy client. Um, he was very, very particular about the coloring, and especially. And, when this, when this uh, heron comes off, the, comes off the press for the first time and the, he's sent a sample, a, a, a sample version, um, he says about the heron, the bird is perfect. This is a letter to ha Havel. The termination of the darker portions of the sky, though, are too harsh. And I should like you to have some of those extremities or outer edges scraped and the purplish tint about those parts rendered darker by the colorers. So, like, he's sort of, you know, here. Um, if you can subdue the little figures um, uh, of the heron in the distance somewhat, it will improve the plate. But take it, um, but taken all in all, it's most excellent. Um, so basically, he's complaining about this. <laughs> he wants that to be less prominent. Um, and this is on something which is going to be done 200 times. So, but they do develop this, he and Havel develop this very close, almost symbiotic relationship to the point where as the pace of publication picks up um, across, and this project takes a decade, a decade and a half, um, he, uh, Audubon can't keep pace and so he starts to bring other people into the project. He brings his son in as an artist, he brings um, the daughter of his best friend, um, um, uh, John Backman, uh, his daughter into the process to paint flowers, um, and he even starts letting Havel finish things. So here is the, the here's our, our poster child, the Roseate Spoonbill. This is what Audubon does, pretty much. Um, he s observes the bird, he paints the bird, and he sets it up, and then he says, in the most, you probably can't see this, it's not the best slide. Um, there's a tiny, tiny little sort of graphite sketch of a landscape back here, and he basically says to Havel, go for it, it's a swamp, paint it. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's what Havel does. Um, and it gets reproduced. Uh, I gave a talk some months ago, a member's talk, and um, I got a question at the end saying, what about those mountains in the background? The Roseate Spoonbill lives in Florida and, and <laughs> Georgia and the, and the swamps. There's no, there's no mountains down there. It's like, well, yes, there are no mountains there. Um, but all in all, Havel did a pretty good job. I mean, this looks like a, you know, this looks like 
southern Florida to me, except for the mountains. Um, but um, of course, all of this makes it more expensive. And as I said, nobody has the money up front. Um, Lizarus doesn't have the money up front. Havel doesn't have the money up front. God knows Audubon doesn't have the money up front. Um, so they fall back on the usual trick for this kind of book, which is to sell it by subscription. Um, and uh, it's just like subscribing to a magazine now. You pay your money up front. I, I send $47 to the New Yorker. They send me you know, two years worth of magazines. You pay Audubon and his publisher a certain amount of money up front, and every you know, five weeks, every two months, however long it takes them to do it, you get five prints. Um, and each, uh, each shipment, basically, uh, he's a good, they're good salesmen. Um, each shipment contains one large bird, like this one, one that fills up the whole plate, um, fills up the whole sheet. Two medium-sized birds, ones that fill up most of the sheet, but not quite all of it. Um, and because he's doing this scientific project where you have to show all of the birds of North America, inevitably, you know, we do have things like chickadees and juncos around here who are never going to fit on that. You, each, each box or each you know, shipment gets one small bird, and you can see those in the show as well. Um, uh, it's, they're good salesmen. And Audubon goes into salesman mode. Um, this actually dates from, uh, from the Lizars episode. Lizars decides, all right, you've got to go and sell this book. You have to put yourself out there as the voice and the vision of this, of this book um, and tells him essentially how to pose for his portrait in his wolfskin coat, with bear grease in his hair, holding his rifle. This is meant, he, essentially Audubon himself is a piece of American wildlife in this project. Um, it's, he clearly embraces it. I mean, he does actually like to, you know, he doesn't like to dress up in, in sort of fancy court clothes, but um, uh, he's, putting on, he's putting on his Daniel Boone act, essentially, for the English and Scottish audience. And he's very, very, very successful at it because they do sell about 200 subscriptions. Not everybody finishes the book, um, but uh, at the end of the publication process in 1839, um, they publish a list of the subscribers um, in the text, in part, in, with the text. And you may or may not be able to read all of these, but you know, here's the list of American subscribers. And it includes the sorts of places you'd expect, libraries, uh, learned institutions, wealthy merchants, um, and then the European subscribers are here and go on for several more pages. It's here, though, where um, it shows how successful Audubon is at representing something different and something new, because here he really has uh, not scraped the bottom of the barrel, but the opposite. You know, it starts with the queen. Um, <laughs> And goes through the French king and the other French king and the, you know, um, all the way through a long list of aristocrats. So um, these are the people who have the money to buy a thousand dollar book, of course. But um, this is, um, was, a, was a little Google map that was put together by a, a brilliant young guy named Jeremy Dibble, who uh, was in Boston for a few years and is now running um, press outreach for the Rare Book School in Virginia. Um, basically saying, where did these books go? Where did the Audubons go? And he basically tracked where, I mean, this isn't new information, but he was the first to put it together in a graphical way. Um, uh, and they landed pretty much where you'd expect in, um, in the Americas. They land in and around Boston, New York, Philadelphia, South Carolina, which is partly because South Carolina is rich at that point and partly because um, Audubon's best friend, John Backman, is from South Carolina. Um, and then a few scattered ones. The, um, the, the Michigan legislature bought a copy for the university before they set up the university. Um, uh, that's how iconic the book came. In Europe, it's much more interesting. It really is England and Scotland. I mean, there's a couple of copies around elsewhere. There's one at the Tyler's Museum in Harlem, which is meant to be a sort of enlightenment cabinet of, um, not wonders, but a cabinet where you bring all of knowledge together. Um, wonderful place. If you're ever in Harlem, go to the Tyler, Tyler's Museum. Um, you know, a couple in Paris, but mostly English country houses. Um, <clears throat> so it worked. Um, but it still doesn't actually explain what the magic is. Um, uh, but I think we're beginning to get at it a little bit. 
because I don't, ultimately, what makes it special is not the fact that it was expensive, or not the fact that it was big, or not the fact that Audubon dressed up in funny clothing. Um, it's about the spirit that lay behind his way of painting the birds. And oddly, I think the way you get at that is not, or at least not only, by looking at the pictures. It's by um, hearing his voice. Um, because Audubon was unusually for uh, an artist, and enthusiastic and an exceptionally talented writer. Um, and more than most writers, and certainly more than most artist writers, and Lord knows there are a lot of 19th century American artists who wrote, um, but only one has managed to get himself into the Library of America, which is this publication series meant to um, pull together the best of American writing. Um, and that's Audubon, obviously. Um, He's incredibly gifted, and what it also shows is he's an incredibly enthusiastic and incredibly um, vivid personality. Um, he was poetic. He was, by his own admission, somewhat bombastic. He was unafraid of informality. He's always breaking out of, of his role as narrator and addressing the reader directly, saying, reader, reader, come with me. Come, reader, look. Um, he, there's an urgency and a delight in his words which are really indicative of his personality and I think sort of blend out into the art as well. He doesn't just write. He doesn't write narratives of, or he doesn't write descriptions of, he, of his birds. He narrates, and that's too, too, he performs his experiences with the birds in the wilderness. Um, and do you remember that moment of triumph where he's you know, revealing the drawings to Lazar's? That level of enthusiasm, that level of direct address, though that was in a letter, that comes out in all of the formal writing he does as well. Um, he is in so extraordinarily excited and so almost sort of missionary about what he's doing um, that he wants to pick you up by the lapels and pull you along with him. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, um, let's take a quick trip to South Carolina with him. Um, he's visiting John Backman um, in Charleston. And this passage is from the description that he publishes to go with um, this plate, which is um, two um, barn owls. Having arrived at Charleston, South Carolina, in October 1833, as soon as my family and myself were settled in the house of my friend, the Reverend John Backman, I received information that a pair of owls had, had a nest in the upper story of an abandoned sugar house in the city. I immediately proceeded to the place. We, we ascended cautiously, I having pulled off my boots to prevent noise. When we reached it, I found a sort of large garret filled with sugar molds. I love that detail, um, the sugar molds, so you can see them. Um, and lighted by several windows, one of which had two panes broken. I had once discovered the spot where the owls were by the hissing sounds of the young ones and approached slowly and cautiously towards them until within a few feet when the parent bird, seeing me, flew quickly through the window, touched the frame of the, win of the broken panes and glided silently through the aperture. I could not even afterwards observe the course of its flight. Over and over again, he puts you in his point of view. Um, and he does this with every kind of species imaginable. And he does it funny, he does it tragic, he does it poetic. Um, but it doesn't always, it isn't even just about what he's seeing. Sometimes he's describing the experience. So a couple of, a f shortly after that moment in the sugar house, um, he's going on a, an expedition out into Charleston Harbor um, with some friends. And he's narrating not a bird, he's just narrating what goes on. Um, now, reader, allow me to say a few words respecting our lodgings out in the harbor. Fish, fowl, and oysters had been procured in abundance, and besides those delicacies, we had taken for, with us from Charleston some steaks of beef and a sufficiency of good beverage. But we had no cook, save your humble servant. A blazing fire warmed and lighted our only apartment. The oysters and fish were thrown on the hot embers, the steaks we stuck on sticks in front of them, and ere long, every one felt perfectly contented. It is true we had forgotten to bring salt with us, but I soon proved to my merry companions that hunters can find a good substitute in their powder flasks. Our salt on this occasion was gunpowder, as it had been with me many a time, and to our keen appetites the steaks thus salted were quite as savory as any of us ever found um, cooked by best cooked at home. 
Our fingers and mouths no doubt bore the marks of the villainous saltpeter, or rather of the charcoal with which it is mixed. For plates and forks we had none, but this only increased our mirth. Supper over, we spread our blankets on the log floor, extended ourselves on them, and with our feet toward the fire, our arms under our heads for pillows, I need not tell you how soundly we slept. I mean, this is a, this is a guy in the early, early 19th century who's essentially describing a barbecue. Um, <laughs> and that is in itself significant because that's not what people do for publication in the early 19th century. They are tremendously concerned with their dignity, their gentlemanliness, their propriety. He's telling you that he was eating with his hands and wiping it on his face. That, you don't do that. <laughs> um, and I think that ultimately is what comes across in the pictures. Not that specific experience, but this sense of being close to the action um, and uh, being sort of close to what, um, cl close to with him. And he, there's one wonderful passage in the Roseate Spoonbill where he talks about how he has to, how you have to, if you want to get close to them, you have to be someone who is good at, perhaps like you, reader, who is good at creeping through the sawgrass. You know, he lets you be part of the, part of the experience. And um, that, I think, ultimately is why he becomes the poster boy, because the pictures have a vividness. And though he wasn't worried about the collapse of bird populations or the decline of the scenic beauty of the country or the loss of wilderness. Several decades after Audubon, people were starting to worry about that. Um, and they were particularly worried about a collapse in bird populations. Um, he describes um, sitting, for example, uh, in the, the Ohio Valley watching huge flocks of passenger pigeons fly overhead. I mean, flocks so big that he, count, that he calculated them to you know, be in the billions of birds, flocks that took hours to pass overhead. <clears throat> um, by the 1880s and 90s, those flocks have disappeared, and there's always rumors about where they've gone. You know, perhaps they went out west, perhaps they're down in South America. But no, they'd been hunted. Um, and it wasn't just the passenger pigeons. Um, it was all sorts of other birds. And that book that I showed you, um, uh, oh, oh, sorry, Here was, here's Charleston. <laughs> I put this in largely because you can imagine him sitting on this rock. Um, uh, that book I showed you captures some of his, some of his uh, Audubon's presence. So here's that picture of the herring gulls, um, the museum diorama in, in the 1890s. Um, what's it based on? It's actually based on an Audubon. Um, you know, modified, reversed, flipped, but still pretty much an homage to Audubon. So when the naturalists are doing this in the 1880s, they have Audubon in their head because they have the pictures in their head. Um, and as the bird populations seem to be collapsing, um, that book is actually a cry to action, um, the book from which this comes. Um, Birds That Hunt and Are Hunted is the title. Um, and it begins, very simply, bird life is disappearing from the United States and Canada at so alarming a rate, I sometimes feel it is wrong at this day and age of the world to encourage the hunting and shooting of birds of any kind. Um, Audubon hangs over this book. I mean, he hangs over it in the pictures, he hangs over it in the prose, um, and he's even invoked, essentially, um, as the way to get to know the birds. Um, the surest way to promote the sentiment of bird protection is to induce our people to study the birds. Nearly every man, woman, and child who becomes intimately acquainted with them learns to love and respect them for their incalculable benefits. The reading of such a book as this is a step in the right direction. But what you really need to do is to lead the reader into the fields, into the woods, and by the waters. And I think that's what people have a sense that Audubon does. He gets you down at bird's eye view. I mean, and I don't mean high up in this case, I mean low. Um, and the fact that he's in their minds, both visually and they, read, they do read Audubon. The words are not as well known even in the 19th century as they are now. Um, but that, I think, is the key to why Audubon has, is so potent. There is this moment of crisis in the bird populations. There are organizations being set up to stop people from doing things like hunting tropical birds for plumes on hats, or even putting whole birds on your hat. Um, that's what this book that I was, sh was reading from is to a large degree about. Um, and Audubon, despite his sort of mass murder, <laughs> 
is the one who can bring you to do that because he's the one who actually spent the time with them. And I think that's what is so special about him. Not his knowledge, not his scholarship, but his personality. Um, so that's what I've got to say, um, but I'm happy to s take questions. There's a lot I didn't cover, of course. <laughs> so, and I can, I've got some readings if you'd like. You want a bird or two? <laughs> um, oh, yes, here's the passenger pigeon, who is the frontispiece to that book. Um, the book was published in 1898, and the last living um, passenger pigeon dies within a decade um, in captivity. Um, but, well, just how about some poetry to, to end out? And apologies if you've heard me do this before. <laughs> Ranged, this is the American white pelican. Ranged along the margins of the sandbar in broken array stand a hundred heavy-bodied pelicans. Gorgeous tint, tints, all autumnal, enrich the foliage of every tree around, the reflection of which, like fragments of the rainbow, seems to fill the very depths of the placid and almost sleeping waters of the Ohio. <clears throat> the subdued and ruddy beams of the orb of day assure me that the Indian summer has commenced, that happy season of unrivaled loveliness and serenity, symbolic of, of autumnal life, which to every enthusiastic lover of nature must be the purest and calmest period of his career. Pluming themselves, the gorged pelicans patiently wait the return of hunger. Should one of them chance to gape, all, as if by sympathy, in succession open their long and broad mandibles, yawning lazily and ludicrously. I mean, this is a guy who did not speak English until he was 17 years old. Um, and he's writing, um, he's writing like someone like Joseph Conrad or Vladimir Nabokov, someone who, um, by coming to the language late, in a funny way, can see it off kilter in a way. Um, he, it's, you do get the sense that despite all of the enthusiasm and all of the passion, he's picking up these words and he's kind of holding them and looking at them and it's like, is this the right one? Yeah, that one. Um, uh, but he writes with this uh, with an almost French rhythm sometimes, and then other times he tells jokes. It's, it's, really, it's really extraordinary, and I cannot encourage you um, enough to pick up a copy of the books on the, on the reading list and read some. They don't take, you know, each section in the, what he calls the ornithological biography, um, each bird gets one. It's only a few pages, so it's worth, it's worth doing. And we've, in the show, we've paired the pictures with small excerpts from the writings. But those small excerpts aren't, don't give you the full picture. Uh, you need more. Um, anyway, so uh, questions, comments? Yes? Have you ever seen a picture of an American turkey? Yes. Would you have it? I don't have it, no. Um, uh, the very first bird in the Birds of America is the turkey, um, which is a nice symbolic touch. Um, <clears throat> it's not, we didn't include it in the show, Partly because our um, our copy of the turkey is a little is a little bit um, worse for wear, um, and uh, sort of you know chipped around the edges and a little bit soiled. Um, it's but it's quite a it's quite an impressive image, and I think he knows that he's starting with it for the you know he's starting with it because this is the you know the representative bird. He doesn't start with the bald eagle, or what he calls the white headed eagle. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, ben Franklin at one point suggested the turkey would be a better national bird than the white-headed eagle. So, but, uh, yeah. Does the MFA own a complete set? The question is whether the MFA owns a complete set, and the answer is yes. Um, the but yes with an asterisk. Um, we have all 435 plates, um, and we have a set of bindings for those 435 plates, but they do not actually form a book. Uh, because when our copy arrived in 1921, a gift from a, from a, a local family, um, it was showing strain, it was showing um, sort of stress. The plates were getting chipped from being the pages being turned. Um, so they took the decision that we would almost certainly not take today uh, to disbind the book. Um, so they sliced out each of the pages, keeping them separately. Um, they kept the bindings, which is good. Um, I mean, this is a piece of curatorial bad behavior that would not probably be tolerated now. I certainly wouldn't do it. Um, but in a funny way, it did have the benefit of allowing us to have the show, 
because otherwise we would only be able to show four at a time. Um, so uh, wouldn't do it now, but they did it then. But um, what we don't have is the, wor is the, um, the text because uh, this is a, a curious quirk of British copyright law that comes into play. Remember the book is $1,000 a pop? Um, if you publish a book in the United Kingdom in the 1820s, you have to submit nine copies of the book to the copyright deposit libraries. You know, British Library, the King, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on and so on. Um, no one who is engaged in a project where they are you know, liter literally selling subscriptions um, can afford to do that. So Audubon and his publishers take the tack that a lot of these um, publishers of very expensive color plate books did, which was to publish the pictures and the words separately. Because according to the copyright law, if you publish them separately, you, if you publish the pictures separately, you do not have to submit them for copyright. Um, so you don't have to surrender nine copies of the 435 plates. All you have to do is surrender nine copies of the text, um, which is much cheaper, of course. Um, I think at some level that may be why uh, Audubon as a writer has been occluded um, from memory because you don't have the pattern that you have in those earlier bird books of the text and the images being literally bound together. They come separately. I mean, even in that slide from Christie's, at the very beginning, is this, well, you remember the, um, it would be at the very beginning. They're separately, they're in separate boxes. Those big red boxes at the bottom here. And this is, so these are the pictures, and this is the text. Um, and you, they are very easily taken apart. So uh, you have to be reading and turning the pages, and it's not, it, <laughs> But they do get published together later, but uh, they have not, in, in most cases, they have not traveled through time together. And that, I think, affects how much people read them. But, uh, yes, sir, in the back. You oh, had yeah. uh, spoken of the technique by which the original was uh, produced uh, in copy. Mm -hmm. But what about the original? Was it on canvas? Where are those originals? The question is about Audubon's actual original paintings. Um, Audubon worked in the field and then in sort of kind of traveling studios and sometimes at home. He works on paper. Um, he also work, he does do canvas paintings, but most, but, but the things that you, I mean, the things that serve as the models for the print, for the prints are mixed media creations on paper that he does. He quick, does quick sketches in the field. He does more elaborate sketches when he gets to his pinup board. Um, he finishes them off later, sometimes in the studio. Um, uh, you can see those originals at the New York Historical Society, uh, that building just by the, the Natural History Museum on Central Park West. When uh, the, sa the end of the story is kind of sad because Audubon does not, sorry, does not become a permanently rich man off this project. He, in fact, leaves his um, wife and kids in a somewhat tough spot. And when he dies in the 50s, um, Lucy sells the watercolors to the New York Historical Society, <clears throat> which preserves them together, um, which is why they have them. And they are now, as I said, having this show um, over the course of three years where you can see them all. And really, you, you really ought to. He also, they, she also sells the copper plates. Um, and those mostly get melted down. Um, uh, there, it's a, I mean, think, think about, you know, if you leave a, an abandoned house, what happens today? People strip the copper out of it. Um, copper is valuable stuff. Um, as, about 80 of the plates survive in various places. Um, Mass Audubon has one in their collection, their Museum of Bird Art. Um, there's a few at the Princeton University Library. There's a, some in, you know, they're scattered about some in Cincinnati, a few in Texas. But um, there are occasionally people who will print up uh, prints from the ones that survive, and you have to be careful about those um, because they are, in fact, printed from Audubon's plates, but they're not auto, you know, they're they're not the same, basically. But most, but she has to sell them, and uh, that that helps, but it doesn't set her up permanently. Yeah. It's Um, the backgrounds are sometimes so exotic. 
it's an it's a very interesting question. I mean, is you know, if if he is this creature of the Romantic era and is, I mean, whether he's literally trying to be Byronic here, I don't know, but he's certainly following in the style. You know, George Gordon, Lord Byron, drowns lover, blah blah blah, the usual the usual stuff. <clears throat> Open shirt, flowing locks, um, <laughs> lots of love affairs. Um, uh, I think you're right. I think there is a romantic aspect to the paintings. And I mean, there's a romantic aspect to his personality. There's also just a sort of ADD aspect to his personality. Um, but, um, but the fact that he wants to capture these slices of life, um, I think it does resonate with the age. It resonates with, but it resonates with both parts of the age. It resonates with the scientific impulse to understand these creatures as creatures that live in, oh, I keep doing that, sorry, that live in on the earth in a particular way. And the specificity of the settings is very important. He doesn't, he doesn't do what an 18th century painter might do, just put them willy-nilly in a, in a landscape that they wouldn't have lived in. He's very careful that they are eating the right things, um, hunting for the right things, living with each other um, in the ways that they do. I mean, that, that is both um, a product of the 18th century, but, it's all, uh, but the fact that he's willing to show them in action, as it were. And one of the things about the prints, when you look at them, they are, as a friend of mine said, they're full of predation. Um, and if you look, they really are. It's not, just a, it's not just a flip thing to say. Over and over again, creatures are being eaten, creatures are being attacked, animals are getting, our animals are fighting. Um, even very placid, you know, what we think of as very placid creatures, like the mallard duck, he, chose, he chooses to show you the mallard duck as it's eating a snail. Um, uh, it's, and then there's really violent scenes, like um, you know, the mockingbird being attacked by a snake, or even milder ones. Those owls, I don't know if you noticed, um, they had a rat, or a chipmunk, or a something. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, you know, the, the very center of the picture is a, is a dead rodent. Um, and um, it's, it is notable. I mean, he's, he's very interested in that. Um, uh, yes. Did Thoreau and Audubon ever meet for correspondence? That's a very interesting question. Um, did Thoreau or, and Audubon ever meet? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I kind of doubt it, only because they traveled in slightly different circles. But I won't say they didn't. I'll have to check. Um, I don't know if they would have gotten along. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, ma'am. Um, so all of these um, paint, um, prints painted by Anne, mm -hmm. who, I, I guess I have two questions. Who did the you know, consistent, consistency, quality, control of that? Right. And I guess the other thing is, is there, for, for each particular bird, is there um, a version of the book that has you know, the best rendering because it's done by hand? You know, so if you could right. take this from this collection and, and from that collection, you wind up with the book that's the best. Uh, yeah, this is, um, this is an interesting issue with hand-colored books because uh, the question of uh, consistency across the multiple books and whether there is a particular book that is, you know, a particular copy that is the best one or is there, you know, is does one copy have the best owl and another copy have the best chickadee? Um, uh, in terms of maintaining quality control, that's one of the things that, this, um, that the publishers were generally pretty good at doing if they were high quality publishers. And it's, I think it's telling that the thing that drives Audubon from Lazar's to Havel is that um, he wasn't getting the quality control and the consistency that he wanted in the very first group of prints that Lazar's did. Um, there was also a, a strike at the factory that slowed down production. But um, it is remarkable, though, that once they've done up their spec sheet of what colors are supposed to go where and how it's supposed to look, the books are remarkably consistent um, across the things. I mean, these, as I said you know, before, these, these people are paid to be uncreative. Um, they're paid to paint it the blue the same way every time. Um, and it's, uh, they generally do that job well, or they're fired. 
you know, there's no, you know, they're not, they're not protected in their jobs. They're, you know, they're only employed as colorers as long as they color the way they're supposed to color. Um, that said, there are a few copies that are n sort of talked about as being particularly good. Um, uh, the one at the Field Museum in Chicago is famous as being a particularly nice copy. I've never seen it, so I don't know what actually has caused people to sort of, you know, give it that distinction. Um, another copy which I have seen um, at Trinity College in Hartford um, is also, you know, among the Audubonis, Audubon, Audubonistas, Audubonisti, <clears throat> Audubonist, I don't know, um, is particularly favored um, it, for its coloring. That was Havel's copy. Um, so it's prob he may well have, as the prints come back into the studio, say, yeah, that one's, yeah, I keep that one. I keep that one. Um, so yes, I think there, it's safe to say there are always going to be a few that are better. Um, uh, yes. You, you've, thank you. The question is about um, as people get their copies of their plates by subscription, um, they're getting them bit by bit. How are they bound? This is actually something I left out, and so I thank you for asking for the, asking the question. You could buy. You, there were various ways you could get the book. You could take delivery every um, few weeks or months of your five plates. They came in a little tin box, um, and stack them up yourself. You could take them in larger chunks from the publisher. You could ask the publisher to hold it for you and then and have him bind it. Um, and there is a standard binding that appears on some of them. Um, you could also, if you were a particularly rich and fancy person um, and wanted to have your own binder do it, you could have them bound up by yourself. And copies exist in every format of that. Um, this isn't actually as unusual as it sounds. Um, Audubon is working at the very, or just before, the idea of publishers' bindings becomes standard. Um, up until the 1820s, you, you, if you went into a bookshop, you tended, you tended not to get a book that was already bound. You got a book that was wrapped up in paper, um, and then you would take it to your binder and get it bound consistently with all your other books. Um, it's only in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s that you start to get publishers issuing, issuing books that are in consistent standardized bindings. So this is a the idea of a bespoke of bespoke clothing for the book is partly because it's a very fancy book, but it's also partly the culture of the book at the time. Um, so there are copies that were bound by Havel. There are copies that are bound by people who had them. There are copies that were never bound. If you see Audubon plates floating around uh, an auction house today, um, some of them are from copies that were broken up, but some of them are probably from copies that were never bound or never finished um, because some people started their subscriptions and dropped them. So um, it's... Did the writing come with the plate? No, the writing, the writing tended to come... The writing wasn't published until after, basically. Um, the book's in production for about 15 years. Um, he then um, publishes the words later. He's writing all along, but he... And that's another reason, incidentally, that you don't get these color plate books published with their words, is that writers tend to not hit their deadlines. <laughs> um, so he isn't keeping up. Um, with the plates, and so it, you, get the, you get the writing later. One thing I've never been able to pin down is whether you automatically got a copy of the text. Um, I, just, I just do not know the answer to that question. Yeah, a couple more. Yeah, no? So if some people didn't keep up their subscriptions, mm -hmm. there are more copies of the earlier plates than the later plates, so those are rarer? Um, possibly. Um, because there are also people who start subscriptions in the middle. Um, as so to be, we don't have the business records that, to say definitively one way or the other how many were pulled of each plate. Um, so that's not a guaranteed way to, to, you know, to find a more valuable one, for example. Um, uh, but it's, there's definitely people who, there's more people who started that and stopped than people who started in the middle, though. And people did very strange things with these books. I mean, there's um, one, wish I could remember the name of the um, country house, and I'm sure someone in this audience will know. Um, but uh, f early on in the production of the book, uh, there was one subscriber uh, started cutting birds out of the plates. Um, 
and putting them up as wallpaper. Um, but not you know, plate by plate by plate. She was cutting out the birds and putting them into compositions in the wallpaper that existed in this English country house. And um, it's still there. Um, I've never been there, but it's, it's, I've seen pictures. It's quite something. Uh, so it gives you a sense of, of changing value and also changing value depending on your level of wealth. Um, you know, this is someone, yeah, I bought this expensive book, but the pictures look great on the wall. Um, or, <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, in the blue with the, in the back, yeah. Yeah, it's um, the question about you know exactly how you get from looking to the plate without a, without a camera. It's it's tricky, and I'm sure it's different each time to some at least a little bit. Um, we know he does sketch in the field sometimes, um, quick sketches. We know he does some painting in the field, um, but I don't get the impression that he's out there thinking with his hand all the time. I think he's watching. I mean, he wouldn't be able to have such vivid descriptions if he was distracted doing this, I think. Um, but he doesn't really tell us um, exactly how he does it. I mean, there are a couple of places in his letters where he tells us you know, how I do my birds, and they're more theoretical statements. Um, he does, however, uh, tend to use different birds for different, I mean, this is a male and a female. So he's, um, at least I think it's a male and a female. It should be a male and a female. I mean, generally they are. Um, so he needs at least two owls, you know, for this, if, to do this plate. Um, he doesn't always try to reproduce on the plate something he's going to describe, but he sometimes does. I mean, or, um, or he'll create a story from the, from the image. I mean, the Blue Jays and some of the others, he basically starts with the plate and he says, reader, look at the plate, you know, um, and see how the, how this animal's behaving. That's a composite behavior. I think, from what he was having. So, um, can I get one more? Or is that, uh, sir, yes. Uh. The um, picture that you had of the auction, there were several large volumes. Is, is each one a complete volume, or, or is the, the set of them the thing that makes up the birds in here? Um, th these are, as I said, these are the plates. Um, traditionally, they're bound into four volumes. So this is the whole thing. This is, this should, this, if this is a complete set, it should have 435 plates divided into four volumes. Um, should. Um. Okay, one more. <laughs> Sorry, and then I'll let you go. <laughs> Sir, yeah. Subsequent editions, like the end, made with the same plates? Oh, a, an excellent last question, because we do have one um, subsequent edition. They're, they never use the plates again. Uh, there are... Um, later restrikes here and there, but there's never another edition from the original plates. Um, there are later editions. There's some um, shortly after the book is the big book is finished. Um, Audubon starts to, uh, issues what is called the quarto edition, which is a smaller version. I mean, it's about so big, um, which is issued in New York, um, in New York and Philadelphia both. But it's uh, basically his way of um, doing a cheaper version for people who can't afford the big the big one. It's not it's not a cheap book, but it's it's affordable to good you know sort of high merchants and that kind of thing. That one actually does have the text with it, interestingly. But um, it has the same the plates have the same compositions more or less, um, but not the same quality, and they don't have the same presence and the same sense of vividness. We have two volumes from our copy of what's of the quarto edition on view in the gallery. And um, the first, we had to turn the pages because they fade. But um, the first time around, we actually had um, that those owls we had in the small version and the large version. And the, the chance to compare them was interesting because the large version is big and scary, and the little version looks like an illustration in a book. Um, mm -hmm. Then there are. Um, larger scale reproductions later in the century done in chromolithography. Um, 
uh, but they're never issued as a full set of 435. So that's, it's, this is the one time it happens, basically. So. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um,